and welcome to the 33rd meeting of the Health and Sport Committee in 2018. Can I ask everyone in the room please to ensure that mobile phones are off or on silent and ask uh, not to record or film proceedings as we will be doing that as the Parliament. The first item on our agenda is a declaration of interest. In accordance with Section 3 of the Code of Conduct, I invite George Adam to declare any interest relevant to the remit of the committee. A brief declaration should make clear to any listener the nature of any interest. George. Uh, thank you, Convener. Uh, I don't have any relative interests other than the fact that my wife has MS, a long-term condition, so therefore that might be a reason for wanting to be in the Health and Sport Committee, and uh, I, I confess I'm a St Murns supporter. So apart from that, that's the only thing with regard to health and support I can declare. <laughs> I think we should all resist the temptation to comment on uh, these matters at great length on the record. I'm sure we'll have many conversations uh, off the record in due course. Thank you very much, George, and welcome to the committee. And can I also take this opportunity to record the committee's thanks to Keith Brown for his uh, short but constructive uh, period as a member of the committee. The second item on our agenda is scrutiny of Food Standards Scotland. We have been dealing with a number of Brexit-related SI notifications in which Food Standards Scotland have either been involved or uh, uh, in, the, in the development, or will have duties transferred them to them in the event of a no-deal uh, Brexit. So this uh, session is an opportunity to explore how Food Standards Scotland operates and how it interacts with other key bodies, such as local authorities uh, and the Food Standards Agency and, and equivalents in other jurisdictions in relation to preparation for Brexit. So may I welcome to the committee uh, the Chair, uh, Ross Finney, uh, Elspeth MacDonald, Deputy Chief Executive, Gary Moonian, Head of Corporate Services, and uh, Jeff Ogle, Chief Executive. Welcome. And uh, can we start, perhaps, and uh, uh, invite you to explain some of the uh, specific characteristics of Food Standards Scotland as an organisation? As the Minister has told us, you differ from other similar bodies in that you are directly accountable to Parliament. Uh, so can you uh, talk us through how this works in practice? Uh, how is it that you can be directly accountable to Parliament when appointed by Scottish ministers, and how do these relationships uh, actually work? Thank you very much. Uh, and can I just say that my colleagues and I are very pleased to be before you this morning, and we hope that in answering your questions we'll be able to illuminate. We'll not necessarily be able to answer every question. That would, I think, maybe be raising the level of expectation perhaps too high. If I start with your first point, uh, Convener, and that is that um, Food Standard Agency was created uh, as a UK body just immediately prior to devolution. Um, it was the creation of the then Labour government who had a commitment to address concerns about how food standards matters were being dealt with. There had been concerns that the proposition that government ministers who understandably were promoting the food industry were perhaps not best placed to be taking an objective view about breaches of food health and safety standards. Uh, the then government appointed the Philip James inquiry who reported and unsurprisingly it concluded that there was an inherent conflict of interest between ministers generally promoting food and then having to adjudicate. Uh, and so their recommendation, uh, which created Food Standards Agency and which was further developed as the matter went before Parliament, was that a Food Standard Agency should be a non-ministerial department of government. And that dictum, established in 1998, was followed on by the Scottish Government and the Scottish Parliament when it enacted the Food uh, Safety of the Food Scotland Act of 2015. So that's the background as to why we are in that different position. Now, as you rightly say, convener, there is then again the issue of how do you do that if you're then appointed by uh, a government. And that, that is, I think, there is still, a, I suppose, a bit of a tenuous kind of issue there. The only way that that comes about in terms of trying to separate uh, the how and who runs what, is that there is absolutely no provision within the Act that allows uh, ministers to interfere with how Food Standards Scotland 
discharges its statutory responsibilities in relation to food health and food safety. There is just no provision within the Act that would allow them to do that. Um, in terms of the body itself, it's a body corporate, as we've explained in the papers. Uh, we have eight uh, non-executive directors um, who uh, are appointed, as you say, by, by ministers. Then the matter separates out slightly because although uh, Jeff uh, Ogle was originally appointed by ministers because we were the first body, all subsequent appointments as the Office of Chief Executive, uh, the Act provides that that appointment will be made by the board. So again, trying to uh, improve that separation to which uh, you referred. And of course, as a normal corporate body, the board uh, is charged with the responsibility of setting the strategic direction of uh, food standards within the ambit of the legislation that we uh, are charged to, to, to deal with. Um, and the, the executive are charged with delivering the strategic objectives that are set. So that's the broad thrust of, of, of how it works. But I hope that helps to explain the rather unusual uh, a, a position of being a part of government, or sorry, being, being alongside government, but not actually being an integral part of government. That's very helpful and certainly sets the wider context. In that context, then, how uh, has the process worked, for example, around the matters we're looking at currently around, for example, the no Brexit uh, deal uh, uh, regulations that this committee has considered? So, in other words, while you have this unusual status of standing to one side from government, clearly there are urgent matters of government business with which uh, you are intimately connected. And it would be very interesting to understand, again, are you directed to take to take these matters forward? Are you uh, asked to take these matters forward? Uh, on what basis is that uh, put in place? I'll bring Jeff in for the detail, but again, I'll deal with the overarching uh, provisions if, if members of the committee will allow me. If you look at the Act, the Act is, is in the, the early sections, quite explicit about our powers in relation to uh, uh, food regulation and also to diet and the uh, assistance to the Scottish diet not being deleterious to the health of the Scottish population. But there are also provisions which uh, state that ministers can uh, invite uh, uh, food standards to provide advice in matters where ministers deem us to have competence that would be relevant in discharging that sort of uh, issue. So, for example, because we are all charged, I mean, before I get to Brexit, just by way of example, because we are charged with issues of diet and nutrition, we have been asked by ministers to provide a lot of advice in the way in which they have constructed their policy in relation to, to diet and obesity. So that's on a sort of day-to-day -day basis. Now, demonstrably, given that 96% uh, 96%, 96 of all of the food legislation and standards that we prosecute emanate from Europe, uh, the government concluded that we might have some useful and relevant expertise that might assist them uh, in, in particular the issue. So that's how we became involved, and the provisions in the Act are clear that they can ask us to do that, and it would be ludicrous uh, as a part of government for us to be saying, well, you know, you, you, you can't do that. So that is the basis of which we do it. And, and I'll ask Jeff maybe just to elaborate a little on how we get involved or else, but in fact, who perhaps has done more on that side. Yeah, uh, yeah. so, um, I mean, obviously, uh, on the legislation, we are working with the Scottish Government um, and across the breadth of uh, issues dealing with Brexit, we are working with uh, Scottish Government officials um, uh, as, as necessary. I think it goes back to, to Ross's point. We're not part of the Scottish Government, but we are part of the Scottish administration. So to, to that extent, um, the, the issues affecting uh, food and food safety are, are entirely relevant to, to, the, to the Brexit issues. Um, and therefore, uh, it, it's important that we work um, with, with Scottish Government officials as close as we possibly can. Thank you very much. Thank you, Convener. Good morning, panel. Um, I'm interested in how uh, progress towards the outcomes that uh, you have proposed or how you, um, how you want to achieve things, how do you measure your progress towards um, the outcomes that you've set? 
Well, in terms of the, the yes, in, in terms of meeting the strategic plan, um, we've got two or three things. First, first of all, we are we were very concerned as a new body um, that we should look uh, afresh at just the kind of measurement and the kind of reporting that should come to the board. We were very conscious about the debate, which has taken a lot in this place and elsewhere, that public bodies have a really serious tendency of either measuring themselves in terms of inputs or outputs and actually not measuring what the outcomes uh, are of, of the very strategy that they've set. So you will find in the papers that we presented with our submission um, a report which we receive which actually tries very hard to measure the various strategic objectives that we have set and to measure the progress these measured in terms of outcomes. Now, I have to say to you, that is not easy. I do not pretend that it is, and you will find other public bodies have indeed abandoned trying to, to do that because it, it can get into the too difficult box. We have been running this now for uh, almost four years, and we were determined not to, to give way on that because we do believe that our ability to explain to you and to explain to the wider public who are, 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 are the people we are trying to defend here, that we can achieve these. So we have reports that are measured in that terms. We also have a reporting mechanism which comes to the board on a regular basis um, measured in, in more conventional terms. But we are finding that in terms of the board is finding that if, if it is seeing its actual progress in outcomes terms, and it also highlights where we're not making progress. So it's not an easy option. But it is, I think, telling us whether that strategic objective is being measured or not. So we have put in place um, the sort of measurements that you would expect, particularly in relation to finance and accountability. But on the broader strategic objective, that's how we've done it. And that's what that document that you have an example of in, in the papers we submitted, uh, trying to give how we and the sort of reporting we get uh, before the board at board meetings. OK, and two of the outcomes that are... Uh that are measured, are, an example would be that food is safe. So measuring, I guess, contamination or, or Campylobacter, E. coli, things like that. And that food is authentic. That are those two of the outcomes that you are measuring? Well, these um, are the two, I mean, they're two critical. I mean, first of all, is, is it safe? I mean, our, our primary concern is with the consumer. We're a consumer-facing organisation. So our number one priority is the protection of the consumer. So for the consumer's uh, interest, we have to be sure that it is safe. That's point number one. Point two, it also has to be what it says it is. Um, the consumer is not going to take kindly, even if, even if it meets the, the, the test of being safe, the consumer is not going to be sort of defrauded by picking up a pack of this or that or the next thing, only to discover that it is not what it says it is. So the need for public confidence in the food we eat requires it to be both safe and authentic and these are both measures that we both if there are strategic objectives and we receive reports regularly on that and it seems that people in scotland are quite focused on having food that is quality and it's authentic and it basically says what it is on the tin oh absolutely there's and and all of all the research we we do in terms of following consumer uh, a demand uh, indicates that that is the case, and we'll probably come on to that later, uh, convener. But um, when, when we get to the question of what are people looking at in, in the middle of, of the Brexit bubble, um, one of the things that these very same uh, consumers are indicating, the one thing they do not want to see are any diminution in the food safety standards that we currently have. Yeah, I'd, I'd just add, I think, I think the, uh, the horse meat uh, uh, incident, which is some years ago now, 2013, certainly changed, I think, consumer attitudes around authenticity. I think if prior to that, I think the primary focus was on safety. I think the horse meat incident certainly uh, made consumers much more aware of authenticity as, as a particular issue as well. Okay. And I, I know I've brought it up in other committees about the protected geographical indication status of our food in Scotland. So Scotland brand is actually a really positive brand that people seem to seek. Absolutely. Okay. All righty. I will move on and, uh, and ask my next question. Um, 
in your submission, you stated that as a result of Brexit, you will need to consider a review of documents, including your strategy and corporate plan. And the memorandum of understanding with the Food Standards Agency and your statement of performance of functions. So this sounds like uh, quite a significant uh, um, issue that needs to be taken forward. So are you engaging in the review right now? Is it is it underway? And when can we expect to see the reviews complete? Well, there are two elements to that, I think. In terms of the performance of functions and how we operate, I don't in any way want these words to be interpreted as being cheeky, but if we only knew what the outcome was, we might be able to draft the revisions. However, I think in direct answer to your question, the one that is particularly, I mean, they're all relevant, because clearly we will have to change. But the one document which either Elspeth or Jeff can elaborate on is the memorandum of understanding which we have between ourselves and the Food Standards Agency. Now, that document as it stands, in fact, it's actually got an amendment, a codicil to it, is very, very important because even in the present circumstances, it's pretty important both to consumers and to food producers, food manufacturers, that there aren't unnecessary differences that are just for differences' sake. I mean, there are things we do slightly differently here in Scotland from, from Food Standards Agency. But that document regulates how we share information, how we actually work together, and how we collaborate in the, the relationship, both at the top end of the organisations and throughout the executive. Now, we have taken the view that it will be very important going forward, irrespective of precisely what the nature of that is, that that very good relationship should continue and uh, we have agreement with Food Standards Agency that both of us have made representations to our respective governments that that memorandum of understanding ought properly to be the basis of how Food Standards Agencies should collaborate in the future. So we have, we had a meeting with Food Standards Agency, uh, both boards actually talking about a different area of cooperation but we have actually approved a little memorandum setting out how we suggest that this should form the basis of our, of our going forward. The other documents, yes, we've given some thought to that, but I think really we'll have to prioritise what we do and, and until we know the actual better shape of precisely what is going to emerge from Brexit, then I think to revise some of these documents because they have served as well. There's no doubt that part of the how we uh, deliver our functions needs revision anyway. I mean, I think after four years, that would be right and proper. Um, but uh, we're not about to embark on the revision process, but we have highlighted the importance of the memorandum of understanding. I don't know, Elspeth or yeah. Jack, do you want to? Um, I, I think in, in relation to the, the Memorandum of Understanding in particular, and I think I, I spoke about this uh, when I gave evidence to the, the committee recently uh, with the Minister about some of these um, Brexit uh, statutory instruments, um, you'll be aware that the, there's a lot of work ongoing across the administrations to develop some frameworks of ways that we will work collaboratively acro across the UK in future. And I think we very much see um, the, the memorandum of understanding between the FSA and the FSS as, as a, a good foundation for that. Uh, as, as the chair outlined, it, it describes how we cooperate and collaborate currently, but will certainly require to be updated because, for example, it has content within it that is about how we um, deal with European matters, how we uh, share access to scientific advisory committees, etc. So there's, there's quite a lot of detail in there that will be highly relevant. Uh, in relation to uh, the, the ways that we work in future through some uh, UK-wide framework arrangement uh, and also elements of the MOU that will just simply have to be updated because, for example, the, the section that deals with how we will handle European issues will, will, will be different. Uh, okay, I'll just um, just go on to my next question then. Is I'm interested in whether you've risk assessed how Brexit might affect your ability to meet your key objectives on food consumption, healthier diets, and food consumer interests. Uh, I mean, Brexit is just it's in everything that we talk about now. So I'm curious about risk assessment for that impact. If, yeah, the I suppose. Um, the, the, there's two issues really. The, one is the impact, and the, and the second issue is the timing of that impact. And again, that that depends on the 
um, the nature of the deal and the form of the exit if um, going forward. So, for example, if if there is a withdrawal agreement um, and there's a two-year transition window, then the the impact um, is is uh, slightly less. Uh, and it gives us more time to actually plan and and adapt and make the changes we need to. If it's a no-deal scenario, then the impact is pretty immediate, um, and then uh, you know we sub subject to the to the form of exit uh, it would depend on what we what we had to do. Certainly, in terms of risk assessment, um, you'd have seen in the news uh, we are now um, collectively looking much more significantly at no-deal planning. Um, and, and clearly uh, a key element of that is the continuation of food supply. So in terms of risk assessment, uh, it, it kind of, at the moment, most of the focus is on um, no, no deal consequences and the immediate impact of that. Uh, clearly a transition period gives us more time um, and has, uh, it will have an impact, but obviously we've got more time for plan for it to prepare for it. Uh, in terms of uh, consumer issues and the risks, um, I think there are concerns around availability and price. And certainly in, in a no-deal scenario, um, if there is an imposition of tariffs, then that that would feed into food price inflation um, and, and food availability is likely to reduce, in, at least in the short term, and costs would also likely to increase as well. And that's very briefly from the organisational point of view, Understandably and naturally, the risk of Brexit appears on our audit, in our risk register uh, prominently and therefore is subject to scrutiny by our audit and risk committee, who in turn report to the board on whether they are of the view that we are addressing the issue adequately or not. Can I just ask a quick sup? So, food standards is about feed supply as well as food supply. So, so there are issues when we're looking at food or feed supply chains for our agricultural businesses, which are it's, it's huge in Scotland. So, are there issues that Brexit might uh, impose on our feed supply for our farmers? Yes, I, I mean, everything that applies in relation to what we describe about food applies equally in relation to feed. So, for example, a lot of the legislation, uh, the fixing legislation, the notifications that, that you've been looking at uh, over recent weeks, um, a number of these have been related to feeding staffs. Uh, there's some quite uh, complex European law around uh, animal feeding staffs uh, that will all need to be um, fixed in the same way that the food law will to ensure that that can, can um, operate in the event of, of a no-deal exit. So, yes, our preparations uh, in relation to contingency planning for whatever sort of exit uh, eventually happens uh, will, uh, does cover feed in the same way that it covers food, and we're working with the feed industry stakeholders and, and with other bodies. I, I want to bring in Brian Whittle and other matters before we go down Brexit in, in great detail, but can I simply ask a very... Uh, very briefly, are you confident in the event of a new, no deal that all the work you've described will be in place, in readiness uh, on the 29th of March if it is required? Um, at this stage, I, I would not give a high degree of confidence. That's very interesting and I've no doubt colleagues will come back to that. Brian Whipple. Uh, thank you. Good morning uh, to the panel. I'm actually interested around this, uh, just to follow on for the line of questioning there, around you know key objectives in, on uh, food consumption and health, healthier diets and uh, food consumer interests. Um, I wanted to talk particularly about uh, your impact and delineation of responsibilities with uh, local authorities. Um, because as far as I can see, uh, Scotland produced some of the highest quality food in the world. Uh, and yet, when we look at things like the Excel procurement contract, only 16% of that contract uh, is procured from Scotland. And for me, if we want to get into Brexit, it seems to me that things like that are being hidden behind Brexit. And these are things that we should be impacting now and could be impacting now that have absolutely nothing to do with Brexit. So from your perspective, what impact and what, what, what uh, uh, leverage can you have in those kind of, of, of issues currently that, that surely would, would lead to uh, uh, improving the, the objectives you've set out? Well, that, that's a tricky question because I think, as you're aware, 
you're drifting to the question of, of absolutely ensuring that you have the highest possible standards. But you're not actually, we don't have powers to actually control quite what the procurement rules of those standards. I mean, that's not, that's not within our, our uh, I mean, we are quite clear. Asked to advise. No, we're only asked to advise insofar as the product might not meet the relevant food safety standard. I mean, I'm not wanting to pick with you, but I mean, I'm seriously, I mean, our, 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 our duty is, is about the level and the standard that is made. We have to be ensure we have to ensure that what is on 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 the consumer shelf meets that standard. We are not able to direct in 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 the way of of the, the, the think, actual procurement. I think just just to clarify, my, my point my point here is that uh, that we drive you know we, you know as you say ninety six percent of your your uh, standards are, are are taken from European uh, European legislation, but the UK drives. Uh, that that standard. We have we have a very high standard of of, of food uh, in this country. So we've we've driven a lot of that legislation in Europe. And I think where I'm struggling here is just to understand why we're now suggesting that, you, that the UK, because of Brexit, will drop its standards. It, it doesn't make any sense. But why would we drop our standards to a level so that we couldn't trade with Europe? Why would we do that? I don't. Sorry, well, I don't understand that either. I mean, and also we we make clear to anyone who approaches us because we have had we have had people saying, well, they actually haven't. They've, it's rather curious because they use an odd form of language. They they say, oh, good, we're getting out of Europe. Does that mean these wretched regulations will go? Now, it's a kind of loose use of language. I mean, because I don't think they quite understand. These regulations are the very basis upon which we've achieved the standard to which you refer. So as far as we in Food Standards Scotland are concerned, the, the only way with standards commensurate with cost and risk is up. It's not down. There's absolutely no way we would support. And indeed, the work that we're doing with uh, Food Standards Agency is to make clear that, that our objective, and the food industry supports that, and much just as importantly, the consumer supports that there should be no diminution in food standards as a consequence of Brexit. And we're quite clear about that. Yeah, I, th I think the, the, the point is illustrated around the, the difference between domestic and international markets. So when you're exporting, it's essentially the country that you're exporting to sets the standard. Uh, when when you're looking at a domestic market, some countries do do this. Uh, that they they have, if you like, a different standard for a domestic market than they do have for an international market. Uh, the the clear view, our clear view, and the consumer clear view is there should be no diminution in standard. Clearly, when when you get into issues around negotiation of in in terms of trade then obviously uh, food standards, equivalents um, uh, and alignment, etc., are all part of that negotiation and discussion. So, so the issue around standards in the UK and the question uh, for us in Scotland is, in a post-Brexit world, what is the standard? Certainly the, the advice and, and views of consumers is very strong that they like the standards we have now. They would not expect to see a diminution in it, and actually, conversely, they'd hope to see the standard improve even further. I think, if I could, you know, just the reason I'm asking this is you know, your, your your sort of uh, work with with local authorities is that, and the reason I talked, and I, I recognise you haven't anything to do procurement into uh, into local authorities, but it's just this 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 tension here. It seems to me around the fact that we're talking about. You know, uh, Brexit you know, causing this this uh, importing of, of what we would class as substandard food, and yet the very food that we produce in this country to the highest standard gets exported, and then we are importing uh, into that Excel contract uh, uh, food of not of that standard. So, um, I, 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 it's something I don't understand. Why we why why do why do we why are we not focusing on what we can do and what we can improve on? Uh, well, yeah. I think the, the the point that at the moment, um, as a member of the EU, uh, any any uh, trade agreements that the EU has with other countries, let's take an example for New Zealand, New Zealand has to show compliance with EU law. So, and that applies to any any country exporting to the EU has to either comply with EU law 
all the EU has to accept that the system of controls and standards in that other country is equivalent to the EU standard. So, so the, the underlying premise is that anything being imported into the EU is at least of an equivalent standard to the EU or meeting the EU standard. In a post-Brexit scenario, where the EU is effectively setting its own standard, the question is, at what level do you want to set that standard? Now, all the work we're doing in terms of uh, the legislation is to transfer over the existing EU statute book onto it onto UK statute. So our starting position on an exit would be the EU standard. Would you accept, though, that the, the, the standard of food that we are producing here in Scotland is of the highest standard? And way above, we are way above the the, the the line of the EU. Yes, I think both in terms of quality, the quality of produce and safety of produce, I think the UK is one of the highest in the world. Thank you. Thanks very much, Alex Goldhampton. Thank you very much, convener, you know, and good morning to the panel, particularly to my old friend and colleague Ross Finney. It's great to see you, Ross. Um, thanks very much for um, all your remarks so far. It's been very illuminating. I'd like to come back to the issue of the uh, development of UK-wide frameworks on food and feed safety, hygiene and nutrition health. Um, how, are you, how exactly are you contributing to the development of those frameworks? What's the, what are the rules of engagement and what are you doing, in, what have you been doing prior to the establishment of those frameworks? Well, the, um, the, the, at the highest level, I suppose the rules of engagement are set out in the principles that were agreed by Joint Ministerial Committee uh, I think it was back in October 2017. So there was a high level set of principles that would guide um, the work around how to take forward these discussions about how UK wide frameworks could, would work in future in the event of uh, leaving the EU. So um, that has certainly been the sort of guiding point in terms of these are the, the, the high level rules. In terms of the work that we have been doing, um, I can. Um, I can say with confidence that we have been extremely active with our counterparts in uh, the Food Standards Agency and also in various parts of the Welsh and Northern Irish administrations and also with Department of Health and with DEFRA because the, the areas of policy that we cover in FSS are actually uh, the responsibility of three separate Whitehall departments. So we're working with Food Standards Agency on food and feed safety. We're working with DEFRA in relation to food standards composition and labelling and working with Department of Health and Social Care on uh, nutrition and health claims and various aspects of, of, of nutrition uh, uh, composition. So um, it has been a, a, a very resource intensive exercise uh, I think the area where we have made the most progress is with the Food Standards Agency. That piece of uh, developing that future framework is, is the most advanced of the three that we are involved with. Um, as you uh, will be aware, the areas that are defined as perhaps requiring a UK-wide framework in future are, are those areas of policy where there is an intersection between EU law and devolved competence. So, so we have these three quite broad areas that capture a lot of the work that we do. And um, the, the food, safety, food and feed safety and hygiene um, work that has been between ourselves and the Food Standards Agency, I say, is the most advanced of these three. Um, we have, it has been a very collaborative exercise. At the moment, of course, all of this is, is at officials level and all of these... Um, all of these discussions are without prejudice to where ministers <coughs> may, may want to, to form views at, at the end of the day. But at official level, it has been a very collaborative and inclusive process. I think we have brought a great deal of um, expertise, knowledge and, um, and experience to, to that work. And uh, in fact, we, there were, the UK government published a report on progress in... Uh, I think it was November, November the 14th, I think, uh, in terms of updating on progress with these frameworks, and, and this one was identified as one that had made good progress. The other two areas are, 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 are still under development. Um, there is work uh, ongoing 
and making making again pretty good progress in relation to nutrition and health claims and again i know you your committee's been looking at the the, the fixing instrument in relation to, to nutrition and then there is uh, the work that we are doing with defra around food standards food composition and labeling and again that that is that that's again progressing i think in all of these areas whilst i think it would be fair to say initially bearing in mind the tension and difficulties between the administrations about the um, outcome of the referendum and the, um, as was seen, the sort of imposition of some of these uh, UK-wide frameworks, we've made a huge amount of progress in this becoming a much more collaborative and constructive exercise. And certainly Scottish ministers have been very clear that they absolutely see the value of having UK-wide approaches in, in many areas going forward, but these have to be agreed and not imposed. And I think we're very, we're very much in the agreeing space rather than the imposing space. Well, that's certainly very good to hear. One of the things that would seem to jar against that in the context of the devolution landscape in which we find ourselves is the issue of policy divergence. And we've discussed that quite extensively in this committee. Um, what would you say are the practical and regulatory implications for policy divergence between the devolved and, and uh, reserved administrations? Um, and how do you thread the needle for retaining those common frameworks whilst make it, creating an environment where policy divergence can take place? Well, we're not, we're not on, I think, with, with the powers to actually regulate that. We have made clear, however, that it would be enormously helpful if, on a UK basis, we were clearer about the principles that would be employed in uh, developing a single market within the UK. Um, I think the absence of those principles makes the very question you posed difficult to answer, because um, the work that we are contributing in this sphere is very much regulated by what the JMC agreement said, and it's quite explicit, understandably, because the governments would not have signed up to it, or the Scottish government would not have signed up to it, had it not expressly taken the view that it would not disturb the devolution settlement. Now, where you are moving into, with respect, is into territory, where you're then looking at a bigger picture, not just in relation to food, but the whole uh, single market issue. Now, there have been no principles articulated and that would be helpful because then I mean just as you have within Europe at the moment not everybody is absolutely the same but the principles are laid out you can go and look at them you can see I mean they have certain principles that deal with overriding public interest and in cases of overriding public interest as defined you can have differences between administrations but we don't have that and therefore we're working at the moment within the rules and the box that, that we're contributing to. Can, can I just add, I think the the other point to make is that um, in this sense, a, a kind of post-Brexit landscape uh, is not different in some ways to the pre-Brexit landscape because, you know, there is, there is a degree of cooperation now already. So, for example, on reformulation, for example, um, is, is a UK-wide uh, programme and, and in some areas that we're responsible for, if you take you know, the challenges around obesity, it's a UK-wide problem. The, the issues are, are kind of degrees of difference, but the solutions aren't that actually different. No one's got come up with a brilliant idea that nobody else has thought of. So, so the issue is really around um, kind of uh, having policy solutions where it makes sense for policy solutions to be on a UK-wide basis because, and this is the important point, because we, we believe that is in the best interest of Scottish consumers versus coming up with occasions where we say, no, actually, we need a different approach because, because the different approach is in the best interest of Scottish consumers. And, and when we're into that second space, that's when you're getting into the potential policy divergence, uh, but we do have that now. In, in some respects. Good morning, panel. Can I continue with the female relationship with Food Standards Agency? Um, how do your powers relate to those held by the Food Standards Agency, and what access do you have to their expertise and facilities? Um, so uh, the relationship we've got with FSA is long-standing. Um, all of us prior to working for Food Standards Scotland worked with the FSA. Um, the relationships are well established. Um, 
uh, I know I don't look it, but I've known the FSA chief executive for 30 years, so I think that helps. Um, so I think there is a, a depth of quality of relationship that helps. I think, however, we are extremely conscious that we're not always going to be here. So actually, you can't rely on personal relationships um, in their entirety. You have to make sure you have the systems, processes, etc., in place, which is why some of the discussion Elspeth was talking about around the MOU is, is so important. So I think uh, it's fair to say we have a lot of dialogue with the FSA on a whole range of issues, uh, for example, on incident incident management, uh, that can be a, a Scotland-only type issue or it can be a UK-wide issue. When it's a UK-wide one, we're working very closely with the FSA. Uh, in areas of policy, uh, we we have got uh, diet and nutrition, so we don't deal with them so much on that. Um, but in other areas, uh, for example, around food science, um, we work quite closely with them. Uh, and things like the Camp Campyla Bacta program, again, we... we joined in with the FSA on that so it, it's a kind of uh, we don't wear ourselves to, to everything the FSA does um, but we do have a close a close relationship with them and in terms of the UK I mean we are there are two separate food competent authorities one is FSA and one is FSS can I ask since the vote to leave the European Union has your relationship become stronger because you've had to cooperate more on things I suppose it, it has uh, yes and no, I think, is the answer to that. Certainly it has been um, challenging on occasion. I think uh, it was it was certainly difficult uh, on occasions because of um, the strictures that were placed in terms of communication. Um, I'd say over the last nine months or so, uh, it has got a lot better. Um, and there's been much more sharing of information, which has certainly helped. Um, I think in in the times of challenge and difference, and, and we still do have differences, but I think you know, we've got a depth of relationship, which means we can be pretty open and frank with each other. Um, and usually you know, we do work through the issues that we've got. And, I mean, what, what was important when we were established and why I think we uh, wanted to work very hard at having a good relationship was that the overriding view from consumers and from food producers was quite simply, yep, okay, we can understand why you may have two different bodies, but for goodness sake, we're not interested in just difference for difference sake. So in order to make sure that we didn't do that, we worked very hard at, right at the outset to make sure the, the executives knew each other, but with the new board and their board, we work very hard at board level and at chair and chief executive level to make sure we developed a sensible and working relationship with them. Could I just perhaps come in on you asked a point about um, access to resources. Um, and I, I think I, I, I may again have, have referenced this when I uh, was here before you a month or so ago. Um, the FSA is quite significantly bolstering its resources um, in relation to scientific risk assessment uh, as part of its EU exit con uh, planning. And um, they have made uh, very clear that that uh, additional uh, scientific capacity will be available to Food Standards Scotland to draw upon in relation to uh, scientific risk assessment that we, we may, may wish um, to ask them uh, to undertake or to, to, to do jointly and that also um, is relevant in the context of the scientific advisory committees that provide advice to um, to the administrations across the UK. There are a number of um, independent scientific advisory committees that FSA um, in the food safety territory um, provides the secretariat for and we will continue to have access to those committees and again the arrangements that set that out are covered in the, in the MOU. Thank, thank you very much. Miles Briggs. Uh, thank you, Convener, and good morning to the panel. I wanted to um, follow on to uh, David Torrance's question with regard to consultation, which FSS undertake, and just um, in terms of industry and producers, what sort of consultation you've been undertaking around Brexit? <coughs> and, you know, we've heard some of the challenges outlined, but some of the opportunities potentially which um, your consultees are telling you. Um, yeah, uh, on on Brexit specifically, uh, we've had um, 
a fair amount of consultation, I think. Um, I have certainly had regular dialogue with um, most of the major retailers. In the last month or so, I've spoken to four of the six. Um, and I also talk uh, frequently with uh, the Scot Scottish Food and Drink Federation um, and uh, the Scottish Retail Consortium. Um, and obviously, on on the on on areas of of industry, uh, we've got contacts with the meat industry representatives and also uh, fisheries as well. So I think the the issue at the moment, in terms of uh, there's there's a fair amount of discussion in terms of uh, mutual sharing of information. Uh, we haven't got into the detail yet in terms of of uh, co detailed com consultation on on particular subject issues. There has been one recently around um, health marks um, but in terms of of the practical changes that industry will need to make there's still going to be some of that consultation to come and the, um, the, the consultation that took place around the the, the the fixing instruments and the issues that you've been considering in this committee uh, these were organized on a on a uk-wide basis because these are our, our uk-wide fixing instruments um, and scottish uh, stakeholders were in included in that. Uh, we are also shortly about to go out to consultation on um, some of the fixes that we're going to need to make to our domestic regulations, to our, to our SSIs. Um, so obviously we will be arranging that from FSS and, and that will be going out at uh, the side of Christmas. Um, I think we are um, in a, I suspect it's a unique space in, in in food where there's actually an obligation in EU law for us to consult on changes to food law. So where other departments might actually not consult on some what they might see as minor changes, we, we have a, an actual obligation in law to consult. So uh, that's certainly a, an area that's pretty active for us. And in, t in terms of that, um, you know, that space which we found ourselves um, in, where do you see potential opportunities? You know, we've spoken about regulation, and I don't think any of us around this table want to see, um, you know, poorer standards. But actually, in terms of this opportunity to look where Scotland and UK-wide is, are there opportunities being highlighted to you, especially around uh, food labelling, which you've mentioned? No, I don't think so much people are highlighting to us opportunities at this stage. I think much of the feedback we are getting is around wanting to understand the practical consequences. I think the lack of certainty and clarity means that pe what is more on stakeholders' minds at the moment is can you provide as much certainty and clarity as possible and as soon as possible so that we can prepare. So I think they're more in that territory at the moment than about saying so in the future we could do X, Y and Z. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Sandra Hart. Convener. Good morning, panel. Good morning, Mr. Finney. Welcome back to uh, the Parliament. I'm interested in the financial implications to, to Brexit, and I notice in the draft financial management plan which you uh, produced, uh, you mentioned there are several significant risks around Brexit and the impact it has on the organisation and its financial sustainability, which looks to be very risky at, at best. Uh, how are you managing those financial risks? which you foresee, as you've mentioned in the plan? Um, okay, at, at a high level, obviously, uh, we have um, we initially started uh, this financial year by allocating out of our core budget to help with um, Brexit preparation. Uh, we were then given um, some specific funding by Scottish Government, which was uh, specifically related to Brexit. Um, so uh, that has helped in terms of ease that financial pressure, but um, we're still expecting to spend about 1.3 million out of our um, uh, in, in Brexit preparation for next uh, for this year. In terms of uh, the financial implications going forward, um, I think we're we're back into the it depends territory. I think um, because. The nature of the deal and the form of the exit informs what the financial implications are. So, as as we said in in the uh, you know you'll see there's a, a broad range, and um, Gary can go into a bit more detail. But uh, certainly, um, the no deal has far more of a significant finan financial implication because you eventually you effectively have to set yourselves up as a standalone entity. So we would not be able to rely on any of the facilities or access arrangements we currently have as, as part of the EU. 
clearly in a in a deal situation and again subject to the nature of the deal and subject to what might be agreed with regard to access to institutions etc etc then that may may ease the financial implications uh, with regards to um, to exit so at the moment uh, can we be quite precise in terms of financial implications no we can't um, which is why we've actually got quite a broad range unfortunately and to add to, to that um, yes, thanks. I think um, Jeff's obviously made the point about the, the mitigation of the risk in year in terms of the additional Brexit consequentials funding we got through the, the process in the summer. Um, but we have been heavily engaged with Scottish Government officials on the fiscal implications of Brexit and took part in some work recently to, to better articulate the cost. But like Jeff says, because of the, the uncertainty around that, it is a very wide-ranging um, number. But we have uh, um, established a, a programme to specifically look at the impact of Brexit on the organisation and um, Scotland and the consumers. So that's an, another strand of work that we've undertaken to separate the, the specific Brexit-related work from our sort of essential core activity or day-to-day -day business. Um, and as part of that work, we are looking at capacity and capability requirements, so we are starting to cost them up. But it is very much a kind of, obviously, early, early stages in terms of the finances. <coughs> that Sorry. One of our, <coughs> as a board, um, I mean, at very top level, our concerns are that if you look at the range of functions which um, we are asked to discharge, a very high percentage of those are statutory functions. So there's not much discretion in terms of, well, we'll do a little bit of less food safety here and a little. No, no. I think the consumer expects us to maintain the very high standards to which Mr. Whittle referred to. Um, earlier and which are absolutely precious to the Scottish food industry. So if we don't have much discretion, uh, we can always make some element of movement. We're therefore f asking ourselves, well, if we do not uh, and are not able to argue successfully for additional resource, then the question on us will be a really bad choice of which of those statutory functions are we going to just deliver or maybe not deliver. And I think that's a choice my board wants to get into. Mm. Chair, thank you. That, I, I was going to come on to that particular one because you do mention that you may have to drop uh, one of your functions at, as it is at the moment. And obviously, interesting that you did get consequential, so obviously taking it very seriously, you did get that to proceed to where you are uh, at the moment. So you will have to wrestle, I presume, then as a board, and it may be that you will have to drop one of your current functions, but... There's no indication as to what that would be. We have to assess that very carefully. We'd have to assess the risk involved with it. Um, I mean, I, 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 in, in this forum or any public forum at the moment, I'm not going to speculate unnecessarily on that. But it is a fact that um, we are not simply crying wolf. We have assessed as best we can what we require to deliver within the current budget, as I indicated a moment or two ago. There are not too many elements within that that are of a discretionary spend nature, and therefore we're, we're going to get up against the hard bone of, of our statutory functions. And we certainly would be arguing very forcibly that we cannot afford, in the public interest, to not be discharging those functions. But there will be requirements. Because the, the, the Brexit thing is, 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 is not just about it's another thing. Because the rules are changing, you're actually changing the rules so that whether it's the consumer, the producer, understands these different changes in the rules. So it's all got to do with back to basics uh, as to how you deliver your function. So it, it, it's very difficult to say, well, you would do a little bit of that. But if, it's, if the, the Brexit thing isn't just a luxury, I mean, it will require changes to rules, regulations, changes to practice and procedures, and that's all got to be in place. And it's in place to deliver what the public are looking to, to depend on the food safety standards that we're exercising? Uh, certainly, from, a, from an executive perspective, I think we would be presenting the board with both the choices and the consequences. Uh, Thank you. And, on a, and on a, uh, clearly, on a statutory basis, uh, there's not exactly much wriggle room, really. Um, so, so the issues really around where, where you might make the reductions on, an, on, on non statutory areas. So, for example, I don't know, say the, some of the social marketing we do. Um, now, on the face of it, that might seem a, a, a kind of simple saving measure, 
but actually it's also an important part in actually delivering your statutory functions around, for example, food safety or some of the issues around obesity. So uh, it's, it's being clear around the consequences of those difficult choices that will have to be made and having absolute transparency around what those consequences are likely to be. I mean, it is, I hate to use the pun food for thought, but it certainly, it certainly is. Uh, and I would hate to think it would be around maybe Scotland the brand or something like that, which is obviously very well known. But you are looking at the capacity and capability review. Would this be part of the capacity and capability review you're discussing? Uh, this, uh, you know, dropping something, would that be part of it? And when would that actually be, you know, produced? Yeah, I mean... <laughs> I mean, it is a kind of it depends question, really, because if if we uh, you know if we're getting, for example, more money from from Scottish government, um, and it's not quite at the the full amount that we've asked for, um, then again we're back into the, okay, what can we do with what we've got, um, and that might mean that we can protect some of the the existing functions without actually kind of sacrificing those because of the consequences of of Brexit. Um, so, uh, you know, if we got some of the money, then, you know, we will still need to do, for example, surveillance activities on, under Brexit, but we might be able to do slightly less surveillance and, and do it in a slightly different way. So I think certainly we would have to look at the way we could deliver most effectively with the resource that we've got. Um, and I think uh, you know, that applies regardless of the, of the amount we end up with. Uh, that will be the the underlying um, focus, really. What is it we can do most effectively, most efficiently with with the money we've got? Um, far from me to put words into people's mouths, but it looks like you are looking for for more money. Uh, <laughs> and the, as, isn't everybody though? Uh, the capacity and the capability review that I had mentioned, obviously, it's looking at European, and you would, uh, in your submission, I think, need some more money for that. Uh, is there a date for that completion? Will it be completed if Brexit? goes ahead before March 2019? Do you have a date um, for the completion? Yeah, the, well, the, the, as, as Gary said, some of the work is already going on with regards to the financial consequentials, and obviously we're, that will be aligned to the budgetary processes. I mean, just just as an illustration, though, uh, Elspeth talked about the FSA getting more resource than they are. Um, our understanding is they're looking to increase their staffing it just on risk assessment by about 60 whole-time equivalent staff. Um, now it seems to us that if if we are to to be able to represent the interests of of Scotland and Scottish consumers within that space, then that can't be done on existing resource because we you know the output of sixty whole time equivalents is is you know given our organisation in totality is only two hundred, then the volume of activity generated by sixty extra people is not something we can manage with what what we've got. So then the question is. Well, how do we manage with that additional output? And that back goes back to the early discussion around, do we stop doing things to put more people into that area? Or have we got more money so we can have more staff or, or whatever? So it's really a pick and mix option, really. And at the moment, we, we don't have sufficient information and detail, both in terms of solutions and, and financials, to actually be really clear around what the answer might be. So it might be unsatisfactory, but unfortunately, that's the position. So, just a follow-up, you've neatly led me into, you know, what you're expecting to get from the Scottish Government and what the budget says in 2018, uh, 19, basically. Now, the note I have here is that the, you estimate the additional funding of between 0.7 million and up to 5.75 million will be required to deliver the new obligations post-Brexit. Uh, now, is the additional 0.7 million allocated to yourselves in the draft budget enough to mitigate any of the risks that we've been speaking about? Well, that that range is again is 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 uh, kind of determined by the nature of the deal. So, if if the the nearer we are to the current situation, obviously the less financial cost there is. The further we are from the the, the existing system or the existing um, procedures, etc., and in no deal territory, then the more cost there is. So um, the way it's being dealt with at the moment, the, the EU consequences are being dealt with separately, I think, from, from the general Scottish government budgetary process. So we are plugged into the, to the Brexit financial consequentials, but we haven't got any answers to that yet. Um, 
Yeah, it was just to clarify the point seven additional mil, um, additional budget in the, the draft budget. So um, that's actually so the existing budget we have is fifteen point three at the present time. So that's been rolled forward into the nineteen twenty draft budget that's obviously just been discussed recently. Um, the additional point seven million that you see there to round up to sixteen, that's actually um, as a result of a three hundred thousand transfer um, as the delivery feed official controls is transferring to Food Standards Scotland as of the 1st of April. And there's also an allocation for annually managed expenditure, which is non-cash, um, which is a, a non-cash provision for our pension liability that we was transferred over as Food Standards Scotland. So that's what the additional 0.7 million is that you would see in the, the draft budget. Okay. So just for clarity, mm -hmm. you have received £700,000, which is for specific cons uh, uh, additional responsibilities. You have a standstill cash terms uh, main core budget for your ordinary responsibilities. And at the moment, you have uh, no additional allocation for dealing with EU consequences, but you expect to be able to have access to those for next year, for next year as required. OK, thank you very much. Emma Harper. Um, thank you. Thanks again, convener. I'm interested in the continued relationship with the European Food Standards Agency. I think it's really important that we continue to um, engage with scientists, researchers, you know, people across Europe that are quite knowledgeable. The whole purpose of the European Food Standards Agency set up was post uh, BSE outbreak, and and you know, as a nurse who's looked after people who had a result of uh, Krushfeldt's Jakob's disease and diagnosing people and in the operating room. It was actually really quite a scary time to, to be thinking about food supply and, and things like that. So I'm interested in what challenges will be faced uh, with a continued requirement to engage with science and research so that we continue to have the best food supply chain safety. Well, uh, I mean, clearly the um, formal arrangements in future between um, the European institutions and, and, and the UK are will be all part of the, the, the UK government's uh, negotiations. But I think uh, we certainly recognise uh, in Food Standards Scotland the value of staying close to the European uh, Food uh, Safety Authority and, and using as many of our, our informal channels to do that as we possibly can. So. Um, we are already quite well connected with them. We have our, our chief scientific advisor, uh, Professor Norval Strachan, is closely involved with the European uh, Food Safety Authority. So he has very good connections. Um, and I think we recognise that um, when in future, uh, if the UK is, is out, out with the EU, then it will be more, about, uh, you know, there will be a requirement to actually invest more resources and more effort in maintaining these relationships than might currently be the case. So uh, EFSA has an annual science conference um, and we sent uh, a number of our scientists to that conference this year um, because we fully recognise that, that we uh, want to still be connected and have access to and have the, the relevance of the, the science and analysis and analytical work that is carried out by EFSA that, that we are able to still benefit from that. So, so whilst there is still obviously a way to go in terms of what formal relationships there might be between the UK and EFSA in future, there's a lot that we are doing and that we recognise we need to continue to do in terms of maintaining these, these informal relationships and building these as, as, far, as, as best we can. So we leave with a no deal in about 101 days. Um, you can assure me that you're continuing to have robust conversations an engagement with the European Food Standards Agency so that um, so that the, a good relationship is continued. That's what we are what we are seeking to do, and I say we're building we're building those networks that we already have, trying to build upon them. And certainly, we would um, envisage continuing to invest in those relationships because we we see the um, importance and the relevance of, of what EFSA does to our remit. I'd just, I'd just say, uh, on a more general point, uh, I think um, as FSS we have put quite a lot of effort into actually international collaboration uh, because we recognise, you know, a, a lot of the challenges are, are international challenges. Um, so if you take, for example, whole genome sequencing, um, you know, in, in terms of uh, the help and support that can give you in terms of dealing with microbiological threats, 
uh, you know, th that is a significant scientific development. Um, and and organisations like CDC in, in the States are kind of leading the exponents of it. So we've sent stuff over to CDC earlier this year as well. So, and, and uh, earlier this year, we uh, uh, worked with the FSA and we held one of the Codex conferences in Edinburgh where we had 30-odd countries, 60-odd delegates um, from from across the world um, came to Edinburgh and, and um, had their international meeting here. So I think I think for us, we recognise the importance of the international networks. Uh, we think, uh, going back to some of the points earlier around um, uh, the interests of Scotland, uh, it's, it's important for us, I think, to promote Scotland uh, in that international framework. Um, and, and I think that's what we've done and that's what we'll continue to do. What happens when, um, like, will Food Standards Scotland adequately be able to make its own assessments? For instance, if there's um, a terrible trade deal negotiated with the United States, uh, an example would be that uh, the cell count in dairy and milk is the thresholds allowed to be higher in America than it is in Scotland, for instance. So the dairy produce in America, that it means that the, the cell count is an indicator of milk quality, and the higher the cell count means that cows need to be treated for mastitis, and that means that if we're milking cows that are causing pain uh, for certain levels in America, how does that affect the Scottish um, consumer? Will we have to accept produce that comes with different thresholds set for uh, that might not be acceptable for the people in Scotland? Um, yeah, that's a good question. Um, so I think uh, the the process we're working through that now uh, going forward. So I think there's we kind of think of it in terms of a kind of three step process: risk assessment, risk management, and risk communication. So um, we we already undertake some some forms of risk assessment now. So every time we have an incident, for example, um, it, nine times out of ten, we will do some form of risk assessment um, anyway. Uh, in in the examples that you've got, the the risk assessment that we would we would undertake would be the the scientific uh, element of it, but we would also take other relevant factors into account. For example, consumer attitudes, if you know relevant animal welfare in, in your particular answer, uh, your particular question, animal welfare issues might be part of that risk assessment. In terms of of the decision making and how and where that. Uh, rests. I think that's part of the ongoing debate with with uh, UK FSA. Certainly, the initial indications are that um, certainly initially ministers would be looking to make uh, risk management decisions. Um, our view is uh, our our responsibility would be to be open and transparent with our risk assessment. So, so it is clear what the advice is that we're providing and what that advice is to ministers. Now, on, once a risk management decision is made by ministers, you know, if they've accepted entirety the risk assessment and the, on the recommendations, that leads you to one decision. If ministers took a different decision to our recommendations, then the responsibility is for ministers in terms of their explanation of that decision. I think also your question touched on would we have the the resources to to do that sort of work i think as jeff's already alluded to we we have um quite a lot of scientific expertise in the organization at the moment that uh, undertakes uh, risk assessment in relation to food incidents and, and and various other things um and again as part of the capacity and capability work that we've been doing we're looking again at well what what other areas might we need to bolster in terms of um risk assessment it's sort of technical um, and and particular scientific sort of disciplines that that we that we perhaps need to bolster in the organisation, and that again sort of points back to the the discussion we had a little bit earlier about again being able to access some of that technical expertise and additional resource that 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 the, that the food standards agency is developing in the rest of the UK. So there's there's sort of an activity on a number of fronts to make sure that we that we uh, have as much of that uh, resource available as as we can. Thank you very much. You mentioned the Centers for Disease Control in the United States, but clearly the European Food Standards Agency has a range of uh, different networks and contacts uh, around the world. Uh, and you also mentioned that you're developing your own. Uh, are you in a position where, in the event that you no longer had access to EFSA's global networks, 
uh, would you and the and or the FSA be able to substitute for that in short order, or would that be a whole new uh, stream of work uh, after the 29th of March? Uh, well, the, uh, the the focus at the moment is is on bolstering UK capability. Um, I, I think um, the, the the issue really with with EFSA is um, the kind of uh, being involved uh, uh, in the way we are at the moment might well change. But for example, EFSA risk assessments would still would still be in the public domain. So we would still we would still have access to to some of to some of the conclusions or certainly the risk assessment conclusions that EFSA are reaching from a UK perspective. We would then that would be part of our evidence base in terms of our own risk assessment. Okay, but clearly work that would yeah. have to be built upon thereafter. David Stewart. Uh, thank you, convener, and good morning, panel. We've talked a lot earlier about how. We've got best practice with the EU. It's arguably got the best food safety regime in the whole of the world. Uh, one of the very key tools we'd be aware of, which has been very effective, is the rapid alert system for food and feed set up, as you know, in 1979. Can you tell me and the committee a bit more detail how that works for you in practice? Yes. Yeah, so. Um the, the RASA system, as you say, is, is an, an EU-wide system. Um, the the way it works in practice is it's a it's a basically an, an alert system um, that that works across the EU, uh, in particular where food may have been exported within the EU. Now, at the moment, um, most incidents uh, that we deal with are UK related. So what what happens is when when we are dealing with an incident, uh, we will we will talk to the business and we will find out one of the one of the key elements of incident management is the traceability to find out where affected food may have gone to. If that food has gone to other countries, uh, then we then we are obliged to use the RASA system to provide an alert to other countries. Uh, with the traceability in the food information, so their food authorities can take um, take action accordingly, and obviously it works in converse. So uh, you may remember the issues around fipronil earlier on in the year. If there's an incident in another EU member state that spills over into the UK, then those other member states uh, would alert us. It's a kind of EU-wide alert, actually, but it would it would alert us to issues within the UK that stem from a European country. In simplistic summary, would it be fair to describe it as some form of breakdown service for food safety with its round-the-clock notifications? Yeah, that's a pretty good analogy, yeah. Yeah, I did work hard, I mean, very, <laughs> very spontaneous. Um, I wish I'd thought of it. <laughs> one, one of the issues I looked at earlier was uh, the groupings involved here, and as you know, it's, it's effectively the 28, the EU 28, and the EFTA countries plus Switzerland. Um, it's worked really well since 1979. I mean, have you looked in your risk register about the scenario where we'd have a, a no deal that would be out effectively in the cold? I mean, obviously no country's ever left the EU, so on one level we don't know what's, what's going to happen. If we're not part of this very efficient system, what's going to happen? I mean, have you looked at countries that are not part of this, such as the North Africa, Ukraine, and so on, and Eastern Europe? What happens there? What benefits do they get? How do they operate? Um, because if we're not if we're not part of the club, we're not going to get the benefits. Yeah. So there is uh, at WHO level there is an international network of food safety authorities called Infosan, and the RASIF system does feed into the Infosan system. So one of the options is actually looking at, at greater use of Infosan. Um, and the other thing is uh, some of the RASIF, RASIF information is also publicly available as well. So while it's within a, co a community um, area, is also kind of some of it is, is public as well. So we are we are looking at that. I mean, I think I think the the point I would make about RASIFs though is uh, even in a no deal scenario, it seems to me that this is an area of mutual interest because it's actually around consumer protection. So, I mean, there's a number of reasons, but, but assuming in a no-deal scenario the UK continues to export to the European Union and assuming we had an, inc uh, an incident in the UK which potentially posed a threat to consumers in Europe, it seems it would be in the interests of Europe to actually have some method of exchange with the UK to protect European consumers. 
in that sense, there's an argument to say retention of RASIFs. Whether we can get to that to that conclusion, obviously, is is subject to negotiation. But certainly, in terms of a kind of a clear mutual benefit, in terms of public health protection, RASIFs, it seems to me, is one of those unique areas where you can clearly say, from a public health and protection of public health perspective that continued sharing of information would make sense. I mean, what you've described seems very rational to me. If I've learned anything in this place is that Brexit negotiations haven't been very rational to date. Um, I mean, if we find we have left the EU in March and we haven't got a deal, um, I mean, how quickly can you sign up to... You mentioned the World Health Organisation. Clearly, we're part of the World Health Organisation as part of the UK. I mean, how quickly can we sign up to, to their alerts? And what discussions have you had with the FSA about their scenario planning for a new deal, because obviously we're doing this on a UK basis. Yeah, um, I'm not sure on the timing. I'd have to come back to you on that particular point. In terms of of uh, dealing with the consequences around RASIFs in terms of, of uh, exit, um, we are working with the FSA in terms of ongoing resilience around, around food safety and incident management. So there is a, a stream of activity specifically looking at, at all of the issues related to food incidents and the whole RASIF information system approach. Uh, I, we are certainly uh, aware that FSA have been doing some work with Infosan in terms of how quickly we could turn that system on. I'd have to come back to you on. I, mean, I looked earlier um, at a couple of uh, top 10 alerts from the UK, and just to give some flavour, no pun intended, on the sort of issues being raised. And um, Salmonella was, was number one in terms of alerts, and pesticide residues were the other, which is all good, excellent practice. But I suppose my personal nightmare is we go for a no-deal scenario, we withdraw from the alert system, and suddenly there's an alert for Salmonella from an EU country uh, that we don't, for some reason, pick up in the UK, and we have an outbreak here purely not because we're not being rational because your point was very well made but because the bureaucracy is such that we ha we're not fully part of the alert system i mean we will withdraw from this in march without um if i have a new deal scenario i think that's quite worrying i do accept that there's other worldwide systems we can plug into will we be able to do that immediately will it be as good as the current alert system we have uh, um okay so in terms of of uh, awareness one of one of the streams of activity that both ourselves and the FSA are looking at is is uh, the kind of increasing surveillance uh, activity and what we what we call horizon scanning. So so part of that surveillance is actually looking around, looking at what is happening elsewhere. Um, so for example, if there was a salmonella outbreak in Europe, the chance the, there's a very high likelihood that the media would pick that up and our horizon scanning surveillance would also then pick that up. I think where we are in terms of discussions with individual member states or relationships with individual member states and relationships with the European Commission and, for example, the F um, Food Fraud Network, um, suggests that if, if that particular issue was happening, then we would probably get the information that we needed to be able to deal with that incident. Um, in terms of the, the level of detail around Infosan and what that provides, um, again, I'd have to come back to you on the detail on that, but my understanding is that uh, the, the RASIF information that is provided would go into that Infosan system. And you may want to write back on this because I appreciate it's quite technical. I mean, I'm, I'm quite reassured by what you've said that with public notifications are available with the World Health Organization and with the relationships you've got with other European countries, a system will still exist in a two-way. The key point, though, is the gold standard we have is world-beating. I mean, we know that from everything we've read about. The EU has got the best system of food safety, and this alert system is probably the best in the world. We're going from a gold standard five-star to something that might be less than that. What will we lose going from the rapid alert system we have in Europe to the World Health Organization system, which is good, but I don't think it's the same level as we have in uh, intensity uh, in Europe. Uh, oh. I, su I suppose, the again, it depends on the form of negotiation, but uh, in terms of, of incident management and the application of RASIFs, then, then every member state 
pretty much takes the same same approach. You you identify the incident. You do a series of actions around the traceability. Fundamental to that is the is the scientific risk assessment that that tells you the degree of risk there is to consumers. So, I suppose the risk is actually around the level of information we can get access to, because obviously if if we if we can get access to other countries' risk assessments, then we can we can just look at it and if you like, add add to it. If we can't get access to it, then we potentially having to do a, a risk assessment from scratch now with but having said that uh, on some issues for example certainly on microbiology salmonella campylobacter e coli uh, you know we're, we're pretty thorough in actually understanding those risks um, so so in terms of something like a microbiological outbreak around salmonella we're pretty much clued on around what the risk assessment is and where in particular threats are to consumers in terms of vulnerable groups, etc. So it, it, to be honest, I'm not sure there's a, a, a clear answer to the question because it depends on the nature of the risk that exists and that would, and then the, the level of information we can get um, plus the information we already have. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Brian I just wanted to follow on actually from uh, a point that Emma Harper made. I think one of the issues that seems to be raised a lot is this potential uh, trade deals with other countries that would allow, you know, what we would class as, as substandard food uh, to come in and pervade within uh, within uh, our country. And one of the things that, 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 that uh, you mentioned, Elon, is around this communication um, with the public. Um, I just wondered whether where we are currently uh, uh, with that. I mean, is, do you feel there's enough um, marketing around you know, education around food standards, around where we source our food, uh, around health and, and nutrition. Where, is that happening just now? Is it happening enough? And is that, is that would that form part of our protection, if you like, against you know a, a, a substantive food coming into the country? Um, certainly, in a lot of our um, preparations for Brexit. So since not long after the referendum, we have carried out a number of um, separate sets of consumer engagement to talk to consumers about their, what they understand about current food systems, what they understand in the context of um, the exit from the EU, what their concerns and anxieties or indeed opportunities might be around some of this. So we've, we've done a number of waves of that work and I think that has helped us to to get a very clear sense, and I think uh, both the chair and, and, and Jeff have mentioned that already this morning, that um, consumers have very clearly told us that uh, they, they don't necessarily know a lot of the detail of the current systems, and they don't necessarily feel that they need to know a lot of the detail of the current systems, but they have confidence in them and they trust them, and they don't want that to be diminished. Um, in addition to that, we, have, um, we, we, we do a biannual um, consumer tracker and we've been doing that since we were established so that allows us again to follow um, consumer perceptions of a number of things for us as, as an of us as an organization for example how they trust us so their awareness of us but also since the, again since the referendum we have asked a number of brexit related questions and that has allowed us to see um, over the passage of time those um, concerns expressed particularly around um, anxieties perhaps about uh, increased uh, price of food and, and um, whether their choices in relation to food might, might be different in future. So, so there are some very specific things we've done about talking to the public and, and, and listening, very importantly listening to the public about, about what they, they, they feel about this. I think in the wider context, um, consumer engagement and, and talking and listening to the public has been a really important part of our work. Um, and we've done that through a, a number of routes. We, we've, we've done some very focused consumer engagement on particular issues. Somebody's already mentioned Campylobacter, again, understanding uh, and, and, and talking to consumers about uh, risks there and, and controls. Um, and the other, the, on the other side of our um, remit around the, the diet and obesity work, again, um, engagement with the public, engagement with consumers to help us um, 
develop our interventions and develop our consumer messaging in ways that, that, that are most useful and most relevant, uh, I think is, is really important. So, so I think we, we have, since we were set up as an organisation, spent a lot of time and effort in uh, listening to and engaging with the public. And since the referendum, we've certainly done a number of specific strands around uh, listening to uh, what, as I say, concerns or indeed um, opportunities that the public think there might be around around Brexit. Uh, and just, to re just to repeat the, the point we made the last time uh, to you, Mr Whittle, is, is that as far as we're concerned as an organisation, um, we see our job is to, at a very minimum, at a very minimum, is to be advocating the maintenance of those standards. So if um, any governments are in discussions on trade deals, not for us to get into the politics of that, but it is, I think, our duty to be making clear what we believe if there are threats to the standards that we believe we should be maintaining. Now, beyond that, I think that's the matter for, for a political debate, but certainly we would not want to deviate from defending those standards as long as we are able and as long as they are forming the statute and the statutory basis for food standards in this country. Thank you very much. Can I uh, finally just ask for the committee's greater understanding if uh, you would like to say a word or two about any links you may have with the NHS on food safety issues and in particular with the special boards of the NHS in Scotland on food safety issues, which may be helpful for us in our future considerations. Well, we certainly okay, liaise with those. I mean, Health Protection Scotland um, are, 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 are a major player because they are... Um, the repository of, of the best intelligence we have in, in terms of epidemiological work. And, and clearly, as, as uh, Jeff was alluding to earlier, um, and in a lot of those messages of different types of incidents, you're very dependent upon the traceability of, of what you're trying to source. So Health Protection Scotland. We also have huge connections um, with the whole public health and the whole panoply of public health in the work we're doing, particularly on, on that part of our statutory duty in relation to the diet uh, and having a, a diet that is not injurious to public health. So we're very closely liaised with a whole range of, because we, well, they're now being brought together into a slightly more cohesive element, but we liaise very closely with them in that work. Thank you very much. Now, in answer to questions today, you've said that uh, you cannot, at this stage, have a high degree of confidence in your readiness uh, to deal with the consequences of a no-deal uh, outcome in the next uh, few weeks. Uh, clearly, the committee would be very uh, keen to be kept fully appraised of uh, that level of readiness and uh, uh, in the circumstances which will clearly unfold uh, over the next few months, and be grateful if you could do that. I, I, I think you also uh, committed to keep us or to respond in more detail to David Stewart's questions around Infosan and the timing and the mechanisms that would allow us, if we needed to, to substitute for our uh, connections with the European Food Standards Agency going forward. So again, it would be very uh, useful to the committee to have that information uh, 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 in due course. Uh, can I thank you very much for your attendance today and for responding so fully to the questions asked. Uh, that certainly assists us in considering the regulations which we continue to receive in relation to your areas of responsibility uh, and indeed in our uh, wider work. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We'll suspend for two minutes and then resume in private.